How's it going, everyone? Welcome to Nick in the Day, Nick at Night, whatever. This is a reshoot because we had Stranger Things come out the other day, and I just wanted to go ahead and binge all that. So we're doing the comic book review show one day later. Hope you don't mind. Let's go and take a peek and see what I thought about last week's books. Let's get into it next. All right, we're going to get into Marvel books first. We're going to start with Obi-Wan, Star Wars number two from Christopher Cantwell. And who do we have in the art? We have Luke Ross on the art and Nolan Woodard on the color. So this issue right here, if you're a little bit scared of it being a continuation of that story where he was kind of a younger kid and he had some younger relationships and he was getting this in trouble, it's not that at all. It's like a whole different new story. Of course, it starts the same way with a more New Hope-ish uh, aged uh, Obi-Wan talking about a pending storm that's coming on the way. But this is actually a little adventure that him and uh, Qui-Gon Jinn got into, um, kind of like re responding to some kind of distress signals. This is like this mining colony, and they're having to figure out what all is going on there. There's some monsters and stuff like that they have to fight, or are they monsters? We discovered that throughout this issue here. So it is fun to have those two back together again in the dialogue and the teachings that Obi-Wan gets from Qui-Gon Jinn. So I did like the relationship. I thought it was very true to the characterizations. Um, the art style and everything is pretty good. Lots of dark colors, although the theme of the book is that there's something that's affecting the light and uh, kind of making people go mad. So it was true to the story at least, but I could have I could have used a little bit more color, a little bit more uh, vibrant uh, panels from time to time. They did take advantage of it when they could, but uh, again, the story kind of played into the lack of color in the story. So overall, I thought it was a refreshing change from issue number one because I really didn't like issue number one. I didn't really care about his childhood backstory too much. I was hoping we'd get more stories like this. And then I hope we kind of speed back up and go into the present day because we have this looming threat. We have something coming that is going to take him out metaphorically and physically speaking. There's this big storm on its way. And so I'd rather be um, reading stories about what's happening or what's about to happen rather than some random tales from his childhood and then his youth and things like that. But not a bad story overall. Uh, I think it's riding on the coattails of the new Disney Plus series that just ended a little while ago. We'll see if the momentum keeps going for Star Wars Obi-Wan. Issue number two, not a bad read. Um, take it or leave it, honestly. Next Marvel book we read was Iron Cat. This is issue number one, and we have Jed McKay on this, Perez on the art. And this is my first exposure to Iron Cat in any capacity, and I'm pretty ignorant about who that person might be, or the character in general, or the supporting characters, or who that character is usually around, whatever it is. But this is mainly a Black Cat issue, kind of... Um, a split issue between current state, she's actually trying to steal something right now, and she's reliving moments in her past with some former colleagues she used to run with. And it's this big, giant story about how she kind of learned the tricks of the trade, you know? So there's all these different flashback things, and the thing that she's going for is actually something that she's tried to obtain in the past, and so there's some overlapping uh, stories going on here. And uh, she gets a little bit of, um, she gets some ghosts of the past basically visiting her here. So it was a pretty fun story. Lots of action which I did like. I liked all the coloring. I liked the art styles. Uh, they captured the action scenes very, very well. There's a lot of high-flying, explosive, um, violent kind of combat in here. So that was pretty cool. There's some interesting humor parts in here too. I thought the dialogue was really well done. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought it was actually a really great book. I didn't have any problems with it at all. I was a little bit worried that I wouldn't like it. It's Jeb McKay. He's hit or miss for me, honestly. Uh, but I know the artist, and that's artist is really good. And so I thought, hey, let's give it a chance. And I thought it did a really good job of getting me interested and making me want to pick up the next issue. But let me know what you guys thought of the new Iron Cat down below. All right, the next Marvel book we read was Venom Lethal Protector, the better Venom book, in my opinion, than Rom V and Al Ewing's main Venom run. So if you're looking for a more nostalgic, more classic Venom feel, go ahead and pick up Lethal Protector. We're only a few issues in, and it's actually quite a good book. So again, this one's set a little bit later on. He's still really mad at Peter Parker. He's trying to find Spider-Man, things like that. He's running around right now, and different companies are trying to get with him, or the certain companies trying to get with him to try to like alter the symbiote uh, powers. We have this big theme going on in the symbiote worlds where we're trying to advance or evolve the symbiotes um, in general. So in the main Carnage run, we have that going on. In the main Venom run, we have that 
that going on and a lethal protector as well. Trying to be vulnerable to the things that make them vulnerable, sonic waves, um, the fire, things like that. So Eddie's in here right now trying to just live his life uh, trying to figure out what the next stage is for him. But he's constantly getting these run-ins from like these C-tier villains that are just trying to make a name for themselves. And I think it's kind of funny some of the characters that come about here in this one. But again, it's all about the evolution of the symbiotes. He gets mixed in with some wrong people or some bad people and things kind of go haywire a little bit. And so he has to assert his dominance when he doesn't like the results of those experiments. So it's pretty fun to see him act this way. And again, the tone is really, really cool. It's like the world's finest in a way. If you enjoy world's finest because you appreciate the tone and you appreciate what's going on from uh, just the different characters that are going on there. And it's just like a fun read. It's out of continuity. They can do a little bit more stuff to it. Um, I think you're going to like Lethal Protector because it has that same vibe. And uh, I've been digging it a lot. And the art is crazy good in this book. So that's another great thing it has going for it. So Venom Lethal Protector, I think the much better Venom book. If you want to get some Venom in your life, I would read this book and I would read Carnage for now, and we'll see how that book develops over time. But Lethal Protector is definitely on my must-read Marvel list. All right, the last Marvel book we read this week was actually a new number one, Jessica Jones. We have The Variants, which I really love that cover. So we have Gail Simone on the story and Phil Noto, Nato, Noto, I think it is, on the art, and I really... Didn't really know what to expect with this one. I thought the cover was pretty fire, and I like the idea of Jessica Jones having a whole bunch of different variants out there. She's an interesting character if written the right way, and I thought we have a good shot here to make something pretty special. So I went ahead and checked this one out. Um, it's basically Jessica Jones going through the motions right now in the very beginning of this. Uh, she's obviously not happy. She's kind of a depressed character in general. So the most of this book, until the very, very end, which has a very interesting hook, is mostly just like your typical Jessica Jones stuff. She's going on her jobs. You know, she has interactions with with uh, fake with like mob bosses and stuff. We have a daredevil appearance in here, but it's not until the very end of this book that we get a pretty interesting variant thing. But uh, basically, the Purple Man is kind of sneaking up in here right now. There's an a very special anniversary of of uh, her involvement with him coming up soon, and there's some former victims of him that say, "Hey, there might be something that he has planned for you in the future that you might want to look out for." So uh, there's a pretty interesting twist in there if you understand the relationship between Jessica Jones and the Purple Man. But um, yeah, so that, that was pretty interesting. I did like that, and then again at the very end, we get a little taste of what that variant. Um, little twist is in this story. So it definitely had me hooked. I'm anxious to see what happens from here. But Gail Simone, pretty interesting story so far. Uh, I think the beginning is a little bit a little bit slow in the beginning, but then it ramps up about halfway through and has a pretty interesting hook at the end. So I would recommend this one if you're interested in Jessica Jones. All right, we're going to bounce over into DC. The only DC book that I picked up this week that I actually read was Swamp Thing Season 2. This is Episode 14 from Rom V. We have Perkins and Spicer on the art. So where we left off, we have a lot of different threads going. We have the rise of this new uh, power structure right now. You know, we have the green, we have the red, we have the rot, we have all these um, states of being, right? This like natural states of being. But we also have kind of like the human element, the the the, the mechanacea, right? We have this mechanical um, avatar kind of a thing rising up and consuming all the land and everything, right? And it's constantly just producing. And so that's basically what's going to be taking over the world. So we have all these different, more natural elements, these natural states of being, these other avatars um, teaming up in a way to take on this new mechanical threat that's on its way. Now, of course, we had Hal Jordan come in uh, a couple issues ago and say there's this looming um, organic life form threat coming to Earth right now, and it's kind of stationing itself completely surrounding Earth, and they can't communicate with it. And they think Swamp Thing can because, you know, he's part of the green. So we do have that cool interaction in there and seeing what exactly their purpose was. And it's a pretty generic purpose, to be honest. But I think it's just kind of a mechanism for our uh, Levi character, our Swamp Thing character, to have the potential to be kind of upgraded. It's kind of like his Super Saiyan moment that we're kind of seeing it towards the end of this book, which is awesome to see. With the help of Hal Jordan, we have Trinity in here too, our newly... Uh, formed, what is she? She's like a radio, or like a radiation type avatar that just kind of popped up and really hasn't served a purpose quite yet, but we see her from time to time in the most recent issues. She's still kind of witnessing what, what mankind and humanity and the earth is all about, trying to find her place in here. So we have this giant issue where the more natural forces of the earth are attacking the more mechanical forces of the earth, forcing Hal Jordan and Swamp Thing, the Levi Swamp Thing, to think of a way to kind of 
boost up Swamp Thing's power. And I think in the next issue, we're going to understand what exactly that means. It's a pretty exciting little last page here in this issue. So I'm really, really excited to see how 15 and 16 go. The Swamp Thing one is one of the best uh, DC runs out there right now. It's one of the best comic books out there right now. So I would definitely, definitely pick this up. Even if you're new to Swamp Thing, you can jump right into issue number one and it will hold your hand the whole way and you're not going to regret it. So check out Swamp Thing. Jumping over to Boom Studios, we have Berserker number nine from Keanu Reeves, Matt Kent, Ron Garney, and Bill Crabtree. Now, this has been a pretty interesting run. Uh, the last time we saw this character, he was essentially buried alive in like this uh, nuclear test site kind of a thing. And there was some kind of an explosion, whether or not it came from within him or not. A little bit vague, and I'm trying to remember because it's been so long since I read this. I feel like it comes out every two months, which is a real shame because Berserker is one of the best books out there, in my opinion. It's way deeper than people might think just flipping through the pages. So basically, we're trying to find God in a way. We're trying to find the source of his power, and they're trying to harness it, trying to replicate it. And they're, they're doing a pretty good job here and there. They have some test subjects they touch on in this book. But um, we do get to see what happens when they kind of pull the plug. He gets he gets pulled out a little early, and he's a little bit confused right now, and he's in the middle of this big, secret, militarized base. And of course, all hell breaks loose, tons and tons of carnage. And we see one of their experiments they have kind of on the side. We get to see what her powers are and how she interacts with our main character here, too. And uh, these two characters know each other pretty well. So it's going to be fun to see when he kind of snaps out of it, what kind of mayhem and destruction the two of them can... Uh, can come up with and so that's going to be a really fun book again berserker really well drawn way deeper than it looks uh, on the surface level so if you're shying away from this because you think it's just some kind of mindless thing i would definitely check it out because it's certainly not the case but berserker then what a great issue a great run i would check out number nine one book I was looking forward to a lot from Image Comics was issue one, Chip Zdarsky's Public Domain. Now, I don't know anything about this book going into it. I remember the solicitation. It was a Chip Zdarsky number one from Image. So I'm like, there's nothing to lose here. You know what I mean? So I definitely wanted to check it out and see what it was all about. But it's a rather meta comic book. Now, it's basically about uh, the creation of the superhero. These couple, couple different guys created it. And then over time, it kind of blew up into like an MCU type thing. They started making movies, famous actors started playing the characters, and it's kind of like the world premiere of the movie, and they're bringing some of the creators on board, and it's a whole commentary between them and their families and their creativity, or in their creative power struggles that they've had in the past, and so it's fun. It's a fun little riddle to kind of pull together. Now, the creative team, they hate each other now. They have nothing in common, and so it's been kind of fun to see uh, those relationships. Again, it's very, very meta. This is coming from someone from the comic book industry, kind of giving us a glimpse about how certain people might feel about their uh, creations hitting the big screen and the compensation that may or may not follow, right? And I always say, it's not what you deserve, but it's what you negotiate. So again, it's like if somebody creates something that's really good and it, be, it goes on and it makes billions of dollars at the box office and they see a royalty check for 50 grand, it's like, man, <laughs> if only there was a way to bake that stuff into contracts or something like that. But who knew back then things would be the way they are today. But I'm hoping that things are more fair for new creators nowadays, obviously. If something blows up, they should be compensated appropriately, of course. So, um, it was a pretty good book. I did really enjoy it. I like the differences between the guy who kind of maybe got more money out of the situation and he's kind of more distant and more um, ashamed or maybe not ashamed, but he's just not really a part of that life anymore. And then we have the other creator whose uh, family's really proud of him and uh, he's he's really happy to meet fans and things like that. And uh, it was a really interesting book. I, I, I did enjoy it. So uh, there's lots of drama in here. I think it's going to be a good read going forward. It'll be fun to see other little insider thoughts in the subsequent issues this is part one issue number one so i'm looking forward to issue number two but let me know what you guys thought of public domain down below all right another great image book that i was really looking forward to is eight billion genies this is issue number two from charles shoal and ryan brown uh so again issue number one was great we essentially had a moment where uh everybody on earth got one genie and they had one wish to make and so it had this really cool uh dynamic they set up between these different people that were at a bar we had a band we had normal bar patrons we had this bartender and things like that and we got to understand them a little bit and then all hell breaks loose with these genies being introduced to the world and they did a pretty fun thing where it was like world population eight million and then a few pages would go by after the wishes came by and it was significantly less so you know kind of all hell broke loose or some people were taking out some other people or something like that 
So it's an interesting metric that they're keeping up with in this one. Again, the reason why they call it 8 billion genies. So this book is a cool, a cool combination of a few different things. There's a little bit of composition in here because the bartender had a really, really fast, good um, wish that he made in the very beginning when everyone got their wishes. And so that's kind of protected everybody um, uh, for the moment. And we understand how and why he went in that direction so quickly in this book. So a little bit of composition there. Um, about why that happened, because we all had that instinct. And then we got a little bit of an understanding of the rules at play here, too. We had some scenes with different peoples, different world leaders. Some of the genies were explaining how the wishes work and how um, they perceive the wishes. And so we do understand some of the rules at play here, because, again, that was kind of in question at the time. Um, and so I think it's really great. I think they did a good job of mixing in some of that, you know, how is this happening? And then also progressing the story forward. Now, the art style in here is awesome. I really, really love it. Like I've said before, when the artist utilizes the background and adds a lot of detail and things into the stories. And so I do appreciate that. It's not just like blank backgrounds with foreground characters. It's a real sketchy, rough type of art style, but I think it really, really works. And I love the fantasy element with the wishes in here. Yeah, I thought it was really, really well done. And I love the way that the genies look. I think it's really cool. I didn't quite know exactly how issue two was going to go. I enjoyed issue number one, but I think I enjoyed issue number two even more because they balanced a whole lot of other elements really, really properly. And so I'm really looking forward to issue number three, but let me know what you guys thought down below. The last image book we read this week was Ghost Cage issue number three from Nick Dragota. And we have Caleb on the writing as well. I love Nick's art style in here. Um, the essential premise here is we have this uh, evil owner of this power plant and this power plant has many different floors in it, each floor dedicated to a different power source like hydro or electric or um, solar or whatever it is, coal. And But the, what's interesting though is they represent each floor with like an avatar of that uh, power source. So I think it's pretty cool. Think kaiju monster made of coal and then a kaiju monster made of like solar or wind or something like that, nuclear even. And we have this other little form, this other being that the creator, that the owner of this whole place has created to advance each floor and consume that power source and kind of become the ultimate source of power. So the main goal is he's going to essentially integrate with that thing and live forever. Pretty wild premise. You have to read it. It does work on the page. It's a little bit hard to explain, but it does really work. Essentially through a series of betrayals and things like that and introducing new, just real uh, soulful characters, characters that bring a lot of humanity into the situation. They all kind of combine in here and again, give this new creation that's consuming all these power sources, some humanity and some free will in a way. As far as how the story actually wraps up, I thought it had a pretty impactful ending. There were some moments in here that I definitely did not expect. Um, there were some fail safes put in with by some other folks that were introduced in the book as well. One of them being our protagonist's wife who died in the past, but she did bake in some fail safe measures in here just in case this guy kind of goes insane. And I'm glad she did. And because of that, the end of the story does have a happy ending. So I did really enjoy it. I think it was an interesting run overall. I think the ending, um, as it does sometimes, the last, I would say, third of the book is pretty quick and a little bit, it could it could have used a little bit of room to breathe, I think, honestly. Um, but it was an interesting story. I did like it overall. Ghost Cage issue number three, I would check it out if you were kind of passing on it because it's a pretty interesting read, especially if you're into the anime-ish, kaiju-ish kind of thing. Um, I would check it out, especially if you have those interests. All right, we have a vault book up next. This is Mindset from Zach Kaplan and John Pearson. So I went ahead and picked this up again because it's a Zach Kaplan book. It is a uh, vault book and um, it's a new number one. So I thought, why not? It has a recipe to be a pretty interesting thing. The art style, I would say, is very kind of like a Martin Simmons kind of an art style. It's got lots of different color in here. It's got like this... Um, a little bit less detailed, like a nice house in the lake kind of a thing. I don't know how much you can actually see on this page here, but just think real kind of cloudy, um, uh, real kind of moody, uh, ghostly art style with lots of accents where it needs it. So that is actually a pretty one of the things that got me interested right away while I was flipping through it. But essentially, you have these guys trying to come up with a new app that will actually bring some kind of uh, positivity to the to humanity. Everything that we have right now is so focused on pushing ads in front of people and trying to generate revenue based on people's attention. And so this guy actually has more of a humane app that could be introduced. And of course he gets shot down. He's 
he might not be able to pass. He's, he's not, you know, finishing college. What is his parents going to think? What's going to happen and everything? And so he strikes up a deal with the professor to finish some lab assignments and things like that uh, just to kind of pass on time. So that was pretty cool. But what's interesting is he actually teams up with some of his friends in the lab and they actually discover some kind of a mind control in here. And so they do test it out and everyone's kind of blown away by it. Um, it has a very interesting premise. I do, again, I like the art style. It's very, very trippy. And it did a good job of kind of showing you the weight that this person might be feeling. You know, his, everyone's around him is graduating. His parents are super proud of him. He has to kind of fake through everything because he knows he's going to fail unless he completes his assignment. Um, and then he kind of stumbles upon this mind control uh, power based on like light and sound. And so, uh, yeah, it's gonna be pretty interesting to see where it goes from there. Has a little bit of a time jump in, as well. It kind of shows you the end of the story first and then it kind of backtracks to show you how you might got there. So that's a pretty interesting technique that they use from time to time in stories. But um, yeah, it's not a bad read. I'd say it's about, you know, better than average for sure. But mindset, I would keep an eye on it, especially if you're a Zach Kaplan fan and a new number one fan, check it out. We're gonna jump over into IDW next. We have Kanto, Tales of the Unnamed World. This is issue number one, volume four, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> from David M. Boer. We have Zucker on the art and a bunch of different people on the colors and whatnot. And so where are we? What are we doing with volume number four? But essentially, Kanto and crew are on their way back home right now, and they're trying to figure out where they're going to go from here. They're met with this really strange, eccentric character. He's kind of like this. Um, he reminds me of kind of the guy in Monty Python and the Holy Grail who won't let him pass, and they have to like play a game to kind of get past, right? And it's this Cheshire cat-looking dude right here on the side, if you can actually see that over here. And so what is his deal? His deal is they will only be able to get past him if they tell him a story he has never heard before. He's been around for a very, very long time. He's heard pretty much every story there is to be told. And so they each take their turn one by one telling him a story. And of course, he's been around the block way too much and he is rejecting their story. So um, it's basically trying to come up with a story that this guy has not heard of just yet. And I believe it's Kanto's turn. And so we're going to see what kind of story he has to tell. It's almost like a meta commentary in a way because I thought this run really kind of took a turn around volume two. Volume one was really, really good. I just didn't really care about where it went from there. So it's almost like here's volume four. I don't know what story I'm going to tell, but I'm just going to keep throwing stuff out and seeing what happens. And so we'll see what the other issues of Kanto have in store for us. It's probably going to be five issues like the previous ones, if I'm not mistaken. But um, this one's starting off okay so far but uh yeah i don't know not as good as volume number one but we're only one issue and we'll see where it goes from there then the last book we read this week was from behemoth this is a happy tank book we have red man this is from matt frank and lopes on the art this is basically a kaiju issue which i really thought was a cool idea and that's why i picked it up and the funny thing about this one is after i read it i said man this guy really looks like ultraman in a way and it says from the creators of ultraman we have red man so yeah that makes total sense pretty interesting book it is uh, cardstock, which I think is cool, and we kept the price at $3.99, which was great. Um, interior wise, uh, page quality is good, and basically, it's kind of like there's this television program that's filming these different parts of this one world where these different kaiju monsters are, and we basically have this explanation of the food chain. You know, there's always a bigger fish kind of a thing. We see some smaller level things getting eaten by bigger level threats, some more alpha predators, and of course, that one gets eaten as well. But red man shows up and kind of stomps out the alpha that we were introduced so far and so basically there's not a whole lot of dialogue in this book at all besides like monster roars and things like that so you can read this book in like one minute if you needed to but the art style is pretty fun we do get these really cool little action scenes here where red man's just punching the crap out of this like dinosaur lizard looking thing and so that was at least fun again it was really really fast really quick read um, of course, we get this really weird hook towards the end. We're watching, again, this uh, whole thing happen through, like, a video camera, like a TV program kind of a perspective, and, like, presumably some monster's watching it or something like that, and he clicks it off. And so it happens very, very quick. It's a very fast issue. I'm interested to see where it goes from here, though, because it was pretty fun. So uh, Red Man, I don't know anything about this. I didn't read Ultraman at all either. So if you have a history around Ultraman or whatever and kaiju stuff in general and you read this one let me know what you think down below and where you think the story is going 
And um, if I missed anything, interested to know down below, let me know. But guys, that's what I read this week and that's what I thought about them. I appreciate you waiting an extra day for this to come out. Hopefully it was worth it. Let me know what you guys read and what you thought about your books this week. What were your pick of the weeks? What were your least favorite books? Let me know down below. But again, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, share, hit the bell notification to be notified of future videos. I appreciate you watching. See you in the comments.